The Return of the Obra Dinn by Lucas Pope. Lost at Sea, 1803. The good ship Obra Dinn. Built 1796, London. 800 tons, 18 feet draught. Captain R. Whittrell. Crew 51 men. Last voyage to Orient. Cape Rendezvous unmet. Contact East India Company, London office for inquiries or testimony. The Honorable East India Company. Attention Chief Inspector, Insurance and Claims, London office. The Obra Din has returned. Dispatch to Falmouth immediately and prepare a full assessment. <coughs> Company man woke me up. Said you'd need ferry to the Obred Inn. Not many eager for that job. Seems a bit late if you ask. I didn't. <laughs> What's in the box? I don't know. Hoist it up in a few minutes. Hey! How? Carefully. The man tries our patience. Does he think we want to be here any more than he does? It's the middle of the night, and here we are at the Obra Dinn. Looks like he's going to take his good sweet time. We can climb aboard to examine the deck. There's no life to be seen. The ship just drifted into port. But then, as we move towards the stern of the main deck, we find a skeleton, still wearing its clothes. Flies buzz above it, and lying next to it is a hatchet. The bones lie more or less where this person died. But for a body to skeletonize at sea, I wonder exactly how long ago he died. Oi! It's too heavy! Ah, looks like our friend needs some help. Heading back to the ladder, we can climb down into the dinghy. It's too heavy. Take it yourself or open it here. Thanks for the help, Bunny. Though he raises a point, it is pretty heavy. Opening it up, we find a book. Return of the Obra Dinn. A Catalogue of Adventure and Tragedy, 1807. Preface. I trust that you now find yourself aboard the Obra Dinn. I expected this day to come, and my every intention was to tell the ship's strange tale within the pages of this book. Regrettably, failing health has allowed me to produce only the basic outline that follows. Your presence on the Obra Dinn is critical. I leave the discovery of its fate and the completion of this book in your hands. The next few pages will seem bewildering at first. All will make sense in time. Use the pocket watch to determine the identity and fate of everyone aboard. Complete each chapter accurately and return the book by guaranteed post to the French Office of Affairs in Morocco. The bargain chapter will remain unknown to you. I possess the details within, but have elected to keep them private for now. Henry Evans. Who exactly is Henry Evans? Next, we find the table of contents. The book is broken into six segments. The journey, the ship, the crew, life at sea, glossary, and the back cover. Then there are ten chapters. Loose cargo, a bitter cold, murder, the calling, unholy captives, soldiers of the sea, the doom, bargain, escape, and the end. On the next page, we find a map of the Oberdin's journey, the Atlantic leg of the Far East route. Land is marked in black, the sea is white, and we see a dashed line stretching from Falmouth past the Azores, through the Canary Islands, rounding Cape Verde, and all the way towards Africa. In the next page, we find a diagram of the ship for the Oberdin. Scrolling to the top, we see the main deck, which has the captain's quarters and the passenger's cabins. Below this is the gun deck. Here we find the first, second, third, and fourth mate's bunks, the room for the bosun and the bosun's mate, a small room for the stewards, and another for the midshipmen. Below this is the orlop deck. Here, in a clockwise fashion, we find the purser's office, more passenger rooms, the port walk, gunner's store, carpenter's shop, starboard walk, crew quarters, and the surgery. Finally, below this is the cargo hold. Towards the bow, we find the captain's cargo. 
Starboard bow is Bozen's store. Next to this is passenger cargo, and at the stern of the ship is the lazarette, a place for more cargo storage. On the next page, we find a complete crew and passenger manifest. There's no need to go through each name right now, but it's good to point out that we find a column called Quality, which tells us that person's role on the ship. We then find a column called Origin, telling us where that person came from, and finally, a column called Fate, which is blank. It looks like we have to fill this out ourselves. And already, we match one name. Number eight, Henry Evans, a surgeon from England. Going all the way back to the introduction, we see that this book came from Henry Evans. So it looks like he survived, and that he traveled to Morocco in Africa. That's where he wants us to send the book when we complete it. There are a total of 60 people who were aboard the Obradin, and not a one returned on it. What happened to all of these people? On page four, under Life at Sea, we find sketches of life aboard the Obra Dinn. It's broken into four sections. At the top of the image, we find a sketch called Underway. Here we see a complicated scene of life aboard the ship. The artist must have taken scenes he had seen aboard the ship and crowded them all atop the deck. What's interesting about this image, and what will become useful later, is that many of these people arrange themselves by class or ethnicity. That is, we'll often discover that people who look and sound alike tend to hang out with each other. This will help us in identifying them all later. Below this, we find a small sketch of Formosan royalty. Formosan is an archaic term that was at one time used to describe the indigenous people of Taiwan. It looks like there were only four aboard. We notice, however, that upon inspecting each face more closely, they look blurred. Sometimes the smaller portrait is more clear than the zoomed-in one. This will become important later. Below this, we find a sketch called Justice at Sea. A man is bound and hung from the rigging with a bag above his head. He is to be killed by firing squad, and the rest of the ship looks on. Here we find men wearing hats and in uniforms. These will help us identify the officers. And at the very bottom, we see that the sketch is signed E.S. This gives us our next clue, for there is only one person on the manifest with the initials E.S. Number 18, Edward Spratt. And sure enough, he's the ship's artist. As we continue to flip through the book, however, we discover that the rest of the pages are empty. As an insurance investigator for the East India Company, it is up to us to finish telling the story of what happened to the Obra Dinn. Towards the end, we discover Chapter 8, bargain, and we see a note left by Henry Evans. And he tells us again what he told us at the introduction, that this chapter will remain unknown until we leave the ship and return the book to him. After the bulk of the book, we find a glossary. This will be helpful in understanding many of the nautical terms we'll need to complete the book. And on the final page, we find a strange symbol. A skull? What could that mean? But then, closing the book, we find... Is that a pocket watch? Memento Mortem. Remember death. Henry Evans told us to use the pocket watch to help uncover the fates of the people of the Obra Dinn. But how exactly? We'll start by heading to the one clue we have, the skeleton towards the stern of the main deck. Okay, pulling out our pocket watch, we open it and... Open the door! Kick it in! Ah! Lest we break it down and take more than those shells! You bastards may take exactly what I give you! A man fires a pistol. He hits a man standing directly behind us. This man had a hatchet in his hand. The man firing the pistol has a ponytail and a goatee. He knocked the door open and shot this other man through the chest. Next to him is his accomplice, and he appears to be taken by surprise. He has long sideburns and wears a hat that looks a lot like a ski camp. We see that the doors to the passenger rooms are nearby, but there's nothing inside them, and we can't get past this man to the room beyond. And it's then that the memory fades.
Chapter 10, The End Outside the captain's quarters, we see the sketch of a fate for the man who was killed. His portrait is fuzzy. Who is he? Clicking on it? At the moment, this unknown soul met an unknown fate. Clicking on this unknown soul... This person's face appears blurred throughout the book. This blurring indicates that you don't yet have sufficient information to determine their identity. Their fate may be known and can be entered now. Trying to name them while their face is blurred would be unproductive. Carry on and pay attention. Faces will become unblurred when the information necessary to identify them has been revealed in some way. Okay, well, his face is still blurred, so we don't know who he is, but we do know how he died. Clicking on Met an Unknown Fate, we find a selection of ways to die. Oh, this is quite a list. Will we be going through all of these? Well, scrolling all the way down to page three, we find shot and then a submenu by an arrow, a gun, or a cannon. Well, he was shot by a gun. Once we complete the method by which our victim was killed, we now have to name his attacker. We saw the man who killed him, and we can piece together the clues that the memory gave us to correctly identify him. Now, if we'd like to take another look at the scene, we can press tab to exit the book at any time. So who is this man? Well, he was on the other side of this door. What room did this door lead to? Well, opening up our ship map, we see that on the main deck, behind the passenger cabins, we find the captain's cabin. So this man was inside the captain's cabin. As we explore, we can look around for more clues. And it's then that we notice something we missed earlier. Far away from the action taking place by the captain's quarters, we find a man with a knife in his mouth climbing up to the poop deck. So we now know that there were three attackers, not just these two. But the man in the captain's cabin doesn't know this yet. Opening the book back up, we can at any time review the transcript of the events that took place here. The man who was murdered shouts, Captain, open the door, and his accomplice says, kick it in. This clue tells us that it was the captain who was on the other side of the door, the man who was in the captain's quarters. Piecing these clues together, we can deduce that the man who shot our victim was none other than the captain, Robert Whitrell. Finally, we find an option to consult the sketch of all people on the ship, and here we will find the faces highlighted of everyone in this scene. As the game's tips told us, people for whom not enough information has been revealed to accurately guess their identity will have their faces blurred out, but people for whom there is enough information to correctly guess their identities will be sharp and clear. Sure enough, when we examine the captain's face, it's sharp and clear. As we already know, we can accurately guess his identity. From here, we discover that two other people were present. This guy down here with that ski cap looking thing on and the final man, the man with the knife running up to the poop deck is at the very top of the portrait. Both of them are blurred out. We won't be able to guess them yet. After exiting the book, we hear a door open up nearby. When we've done all we can, we can turn around and exit the memory by passing through the door. We arrive back on the main deck, standing above the skeleton of the man the captain shot. But looking at the captain's quarters, we see that after observing the memory, the door to the captain's quarters is now open. And it looks a lot different from other doors on the ship. For example, this door to the passenger cabin looks solid. But the door leading to the captain's cabin is fuzzy, almost glowing. Perhaps this is one way the memento mortem tells us the order in which we should advance to solve this case. Through the door and on the floor of the captain's cabin, we find another skeleton. But looking up, we see another one by an open door in the back. But we'll start by examining this one. Where are they? Must be in here someplace. <laughs> They're at the bottom of the sea. 
That's a lie. Oh, that was nasty. The man whom we now identify as the captain knifes one of his assailants through the neck. The man with the sideburns and the cap. But he suffers a spear wound in the left shoulder. Jabbed in the armpit by the man with the sideburns. But now we know that our time is going to run out. Heading through a door, we can walk behind the captain's cabin. And as we do, we notice a man jumping down from the poop deck. It's our third attacker. With the knife in his mouth, he's going to come up behind the captain. And we can predict through where. There's a door leading back to the captain's cabin. He's trying to flank him. Finally, as the scene is about to end, we see one more door, but we can't access it. So, man in the cap dies, but his face is still blurry. If we try to fill in his name, we get a message, you don't have sufficient information to determine this person's identity. We can await for further clues, or we can try anyway. We'll await for further clues. However, we do know how he was killed. Scrolling to page two, we know that he was knifed, and by the same man who killed the last victim, none other than Captain Robert Whitrell. We can read the transcript again to better understand what was going on. So the three assailants were searching for something, but the captain says that it's at the bottom of the sea. What could be at the bottom of the sea and why did they think it was in the captain's cabin? As this scene took place so shortly after the last one, many of the other segments are the same. We can at any time open up the ship's sketch to see if there was something in the last scene that we witnessed that cleared another portrait. At this time, I discovered that the bald man holding the ship's wheel in the middle of the Justice at Sea sketch was now clear. But what clue have we found that makes him identifiable? Many of you will guess it. I didn't figure it out until a bit later, so we'll cover it then. But we can navigate down to the signature on the portrait and correctly identify this guy. This person's face is no longer blurred, which means they can now be identified. Well, in this example, it's a signature, but you get the point. Use the book and the pocket watch to gather enough information to deduce their identity. Revisit memories on the ship using the pocket watch to study relationships, appearances, and activities. Use the book maps, crew manifest, and artist sketches along with the individual conversation logs to find clues about names, relationships, appearances, and roles. There were 60 people on the ship when it left England. Determining everyone's identity and fate will not be easy. Decisive information is rare. You will have to make assumptions using partial information. Some identities may only be revealed through a process of elimination. Good luck. This one, thankfully, is easy. As mentioned earlier, there was only one person on the ship whose initials were ES. Edward Spratt, the artist. And now that we are working on this chapter, we can correctly identify the person on the picture. When done, the door opens behind us. We can take one more look around or we can exit the memory. We arrive back on the ship. We can go out the door we went through in the memory, and we see that the man is, of course, no longer dropping down from the poop deck. But off in the distance, what is that? That's not a star. That's the sea. There's something shimmering in the sea. What could it be? Could it be the thing the captain said was at the bottom of the sea? Did he throw it overboard? But how did it get there? Going all the way around, we can pass through the door to find the next skeleton. And I think we have a good idea of who this guy is. The 
gargling at the beginning of the memory was the death of the man that the captain just knifed, but he didn't see the third man coming from behind. The third man stabbed him in the ribs with a knife, but it didn't kill him. The captain spins around, and with the same spear that the second assailant used to stab him, he bashes in the head of the third assailant. This body we find on the ground is not that of the captain, it's the body of the third assailant. Here, we discover another game mechanic. If we zoom in on a character during one of these memories, his face on the portrait lights up. This is an incredibly useful tool that we will need to use time and time again to correctly identify the people in this mystery. But now, the door in this room that was previously closed is open. Heading through, we see a bed, and in the bed, a woman. Examining her more closely, she's one of the women dancing in the painting. But she lies here motionless. Is she sick? Dead? Like with all of the victims in this chapter, we don't know who this is. And we don't have enough information to identify him. But we do know who killed him. Now, there are some circumstances where more than one option will work. For example, he was technically clubbed in the head, but he was clubbed with a spear. So we could say that he was clubbed to death, or he was speared. And then we can choose his attacker, Captain Robert Whittrell. When done, we hear the door open to the right. Passing through it, we see that the other door in the captain's quarters is now open, and through it we find a body lying next to an overturned chair. Heading through to the bed, we saw who? Oh, the woman who was lying in bed was dead. We can start with either of these skeletons. I'll start with the one by the chair. Here we find a pistol lying on the ground under the chair, and when we're ready, we can open the memento mortem. Abigail, your brother, my friend, I shot him dead. I'll be with you soon, my love. Please forgive me for everything. The captain sits in the chair, holding the pistol to his mouth. He commits suicide by blowing his brains out. And as we suspected, the woman lying in bed was already dead, but we learn her name, Abigail. And the captain gave us a clue as to the identity of one of his assailants. One of them was his friend, her brother. Once we leave the memory, we can use this information to try to deduce their identities. We see that the captain's face is unblurred, which makes sense we identified him early on. So we'll open it up and identify him as Captain Robert Whittrell. As for his fate, we do find an option to say that he was shot by a gun, but we don't find an option to select himself as his attacker. Instead, going back to his cause of death, we have to choose suicide and then we can choose the weapon used in the suicide. This may or may not be correct. Fates are validated in sets of three. Correctly identify at least three people and their fates to have the information typeset into the book. So this is the first fate we've completed. We have the cause of death of many of the others, but without their names, we can't complete their fate. We need two more to find out whether or not this fate is correct. Taking a look at the transcript again, we can go over the captain's final words. The woman he loved was named Abigail, and his friend, the man he shot, was her brother. 
we know from the memory that the body of the woman in bed was the woman dancing on the main deck. So heading back to the sketch, we can scroll up to her portrait, and sure enough, we see that it's unblurred. We can now try to identify her. Thankfully, this one is easy. There are few women aboard this ship, and only one named Abigail. But here's the most important clue. Her name is Abigail Hoskut Whitrell. Whitrell was the last name of the captain. So we know that she was married to the captain, which means Hoskut must be her maiden name. If we can find another Hoskut aboard, we can find her brother, the man the captain shot. And sure enough, scrolling all the way to the top, we discover that the first mate was named William Hoskut. But which of the men was Hoskut? Which of the men was the first mate? Heading back down to the Justice at Sea sketch, we find one of the men, but looking at his portrait, it's still blurry. There are a couple of clues that tell us that this is not the right guy. The first is that he was knifed, but the captain says, I shot your brother. And the second is that he's not wearing an officer uniform, but we know that Abigail's brother was the first mate. So we're looking for a guy who was shot by the captain and wearing a first mate's hat. Heading back to chapter 10, we can go to the very first killing, and we discover that his face is unblurred. This was the man who was shot by the captain. He's wearing an officer's hat, therefore he must be first mate William Hoskut. If correct, that would give us the second fate. But to find out for sure, we need to find one more fate. To do that, we need to exit the memory using the door. But it's here that we discover we've completed chapter 10, the end. The X's at the bottom show us how many people died this chapter. There were four deaths, the three assailants and the captain himself. But there were five bodies, the body of Abigail. She's not counted here because we don't discover her fate until the next chapter. Since I'm organizing these videos chapter by chapter, we'll have to save her fate for another video. If we click on the map, we discover exactly where these events took place. They took place just north of the Canary Islands, so quite a ways away from England. Did the ship really drift all the way back to England from here? We know that these were the last events to happen in the story. It's chapter 10, the end. Presumably there was no one else left aboard the ship. The captain was the last one to die. Before we move on, there are a few more things to note about how the memento mortem works. We can quickly identify the remains of a person we discover on the ship and where he belongs in the story by taking a look at the watch. Notice that the hands on the watch point to 10 and 4. That means that the story of this body took place during Chapter 10, Part 4. And we can always verify this by holding tab while looking at remains to open the book right to where this person died in the story. Open the book while the pocket watch is open to flip directly to the relevant page. And sure enough, the captain's death happened in Chapter 10, Part 4. Moving over to a nearby corpse, we see the hands on the watch move to 10-2, and sure enough, this guy died in Chapter 10, Part 2, and so on. With that, we complete Chapter 10, The End. The chapters in this case do not happen sequentially. During the course of this series, we'll jump all over the story while following body after body. It is only at the end that we will be able to piece it together into one cohesive narrative. Join me in my next episode, where we will learn exactly what happened to the captain's wife, Abigail. I publish many videos each and every week, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you feel like you're still missing out on notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.